Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for coming today, despite the rain. I'm very happy to have this space to talk about a little bit about evolution and the idea of race. Um, there are some remarks I want to do before I start with this presentation. One of those is that one of the, my main goals in research and teaching is to contribute to end racism. And I'm especially interested in um, practices that come from science that somehow foster or contribute to racism from science to society. So that kind of one is one of my main goals as a researcher and also as a teacher. And um, I want to do a second disclaimer here. Um, during my talk, I will say a lot of times the word race. I will name races. I will uh, talk about this as if they were existing, but I don't believe they exist. Uh, I don't think they're biological races. And when I talk about races and mention these names, I'm mainly referring to how the authors I'm talking about refer to these races. So this is important to keep in mind um, through the talk. So this talk will have three main parts. The first part, um, I will try to talk about the relation of evolution with uh, progress and uh, how this idea has led to or has fostered to create racial classifications in which some of these human populations or as they were conceived, races were believed to be better or uh, in a better hierarchical position or more intelligent, more beautiful than others. And I claim that this is because there's an implicit and sometimes an explicit notion of progress that goes together with evolution sometimes. Then the second part of the talk, I will develop more about, I will talk about the history of race in, yeah, in science mainly. And the third part, I will just uh, bring some examples from contemporary science where we still fall in the danger of um, naming populations as, as races or creating stereotypes to study other group, human groups. So, um, I would like to start this presentation by looking together at this um, image. It is interesting that it is the same image that appeared at the beginning, but I think it's a, it's a good representation of some of our ideas of evolution and, and how ideas of progress get into representations. This image is from 1965, and it was created by an artist called Rudolf Salinger for life. And it has uh, two names. One of the more popular names is the March of Progress. The other one is the Road to Homo Sapiens. And I think um, something I like about this image is that in a way it tells a story in different steps where all these different um, stages in human evolution are kind of walking towards the end goal, which is the human. So in a way, already the name, the March of Progress, kind of leads us to think that there's an end goal in this, um, in this kind of path. So there's some sort of directionality. Um, in this way, um, we could, for example, define progress and just tentatively as the improvement of the properties of organisms in which the organisms that appear later in evolution are in certain respects more highly organized than earlier ones. And this can be um, understood in many different ways. We could talk about complexity, for example, or maybe agency. The idea is that, as in the representation in the previous slide, it seems that later organisms are going to be either more complex or more something than earlier ones. Um, in general, biologists today disagree with this idea of progress, and I will explain you why. But in a way, we could also think things like, well, 
there are so many organisms, right? And maybe we are more complex or more evolved than a sponge in the sea. Despite the sponge in the seas are really beautiful and are actually really well adapted to their space. But we could kind of think that, well, we have a brain. They don't have a brain. We move around. They don't move around. We probably are more developed or have progress more than these organisms. But this is actually not makes sense within our current evolutionary framework. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with some of the things that I'm going to try to explain now. Our current evolutionary framework is, um, well, it's basically the theory of evolution by natural selection. And if you remember your biology classes, it's okay if you don't remember anything. But one of the main examples of these, of these biology classes in order to explain um, natural selection is, for example, this um, example of the pepper moth, which in the, um, with the Industrial Revolution in the UK and with the sudden change of, well, sudden through the years, of course, to the change in the forest of the color of the trees and the walls from a um, kind of lighter tone, as in the image in the top. Can I point? Oh, yeah, there. Well, I don't know if you see it. Um, there, changed to uh, a smoky, more darker one. This led uh, to the kind of the increase in number of a populations of another variety of this same species that was colored a little bit darker. The explanation from um, evolution as in natural selection is that uh, given th to the change in the context, this other kind of organism had more opportunities to survive. And then the population of the darker variety grew and the other one uh, diminished. So again, the question would be, if this is um, change in relation to a context, does it make sense to say that perhaps the dark moth is more evolved or more developed or more evolved than the other? And I think the answer is from uh, today's evolutionary framework is no. It makes no sense to say that there's some sort of progress or a different complexity in these two organisms. Rather, we need to understand their characteristics based on their context. And this is kind of how we're working today in biology. This is a very simplified version of that. Um, however, this idea of evolution and progress is something that has been debated by biologists and still is something discussed. And there are different positions about it. For example, uh, Richard Dawkins, in this quote, says, adaptive evolution it not, is not just incidentally progressive, it is deeply, die in the wool, indispensable progressive. It should be progressive if Darwinian natural selection is to perform the explanatory role in our worldview that we require of it. So here we have to be uh, clear, he's not claiming that we have to understand progress also in terms of intelligence or necessarily complexity, but rather on the accumulation of different qualities in order to lead to natural selection. But still, this reminds us of the importance of being very uh, careful with this notion of progress. For example, when we see uh, quotes like this. As I said, this is... Um, a, dis a debate or a discussion that is had since a long time ago. We have another example, for example, um, Darwin, who um, in one of his the famous quotes, um, it said that he wrote on, along the margin of his book on the vestiges of the natural history of creation from jo Robert Chambers, never use the words higher or lower as a reminder to himself of how to understand change in organisms. So again, we see kind of a reflection of how to understand difference in organisms and, and change. At the same time, we see Charles Darwin again 
in his work talking about progressive development, for example, an innate tendency towards progressive development necessarily follows through the continued action of natural selection. So in this quote, it's not so clear how progress or what kind of role progress plays in natural selection according to his work. And a second quote when he explains, as natural selection works solely by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. And this definitely kind of gives us a little bit more to think about what was Darwin thinking when he wrote um, these parts of his book. This is an open debate in historians of science. People can go back to the, to the books and to the letters and to the archive and try to figure out what kind of idea he had. But it's interesting to see that progress is somehow a problematic element since the very root of our theory of evolution. We have other, as I said, this is an open discussion. We have biologists um, discussing whether progress is good or not. In general, I think it would say that no one really supports that we need a notion of progress, given that we have the mechanism of natural selection to explain change. But here are some other examples. On the top quote, we have Stephen Jay Gould, a very famous paleontologist and uh, biologist who is telling us progress is a no noxious, culturally embedded, untestable, non-operational, intractable idea that must be replaced if we wish to understand the patterns of history. So, no, we don't need it. Get rid of it. And on the, on the below quote, we have Provine, who is more like a geneticist um, theor theory of evolution. Um, he is arguing that the problem is actually that there's not an ultimate basis in the evolutionary process from which to judge through progress. So think about this, like if we don't have a goal, a, a direction where evolution should go, how can you know if things are better or more developed or more evolved than others? Kind of that's the problem, that sometimes we think that there's an end goal, a direction, and some sort of standard that diversity has to move towards, like in the, in the first image. If we believe that the human is kind of the end result of evolution, the masterpiece, then we are kind of setting a standard where every other organism has to move towards. And, um, and that's something that I think has to some degree happened understanding human diversity and its connection to change, to evolution, and to this implicit idea of progress. And this combination has led or supported um, the, our possibility to classify humans in races, so has supported the idea of race. And this is what I'm trying to explain in the rest of the talk as well. So I see two elements that are dangerously behind this idea of evolution and progress and human difference, which are our directionality of change. So we are going to be better when we reach that stage. In some, some cases, biological perfection, more intelligence, more beauty, more civilized places to live or lifestyles takes different shapes, and also the action of comparing different group, human groups based on that standard. So now I'm coming to the second part of the talk where I am going to give you some, some insights into the history of the idea of race. Of course, I'm leaving a lot of stuff behind, uh, but um, I hope we can have a conversation about it after. So I decided to start this story with the Scala Natura, or the Great Change of, of Being, which is a hierarchical structure um, that orders every organism 
from God perfection to the most less perfect organism, including minerals. This is a, um, a framework that is outside our biological uh, theoretical framework. So it's more about, underst this was a decre decreed by God, so it comes from a very different place, and it's basically organizing things based on perfection. It was introduced by uh, Aristotle, and it was also worked by Plato, Plot Plotinus, and Proclus, all these Greek, and, and it also it was popular already in the Middle Ages. And we can somehow also suspect that it had a very big influence as well in later naturalists like Lamarck or Darwin. For example, when Darwin talks about perfection. Um, so um, the second stage, that, well, as I said, this uh, goes from God to angels, humans, and so on, until it goes to the very bottom. In a more uh, closer to science way of categorizing uh, organisms, we find the work of Carl Linné, and I'm sure um, you have heard probably about this name, but he's very famous and his work is very relevant to organize um, living beings based on um, in a more naturalistic framework. So not so much relying on ideas of God or perfection, but rather looking at the organisms and their characteristics. So two of the most important things he did for current biology as well is the introduction of the concept of species, um, the one that we use as well now, and the introduction of this uh, binomial, binomial nomenclature for species, you know, that you write two different Latin names, that's because he wanted he organized things like that. So we still use this system. Um, in her, the first edition of the Sistema Natura, which was published in 1735, he um, organized everything in three kingdoms, plants, animals, and minerals. And then also what is really interesting and very important for the history of race in science is that he introduced um, humans as part of the order anthropomorpha, as we can see in that square. So, and in this cat categorization, he identified then four different species of humans, which are Europeus, Americanus, Africanus, and, um, thank you, it's very small. Um, so, in that way, this, this is the way in how uh, these human differences become then organized and labeled in current biology or in the biology at the time with a system that we still use today. Uh, later on, around the same time, in 1775, uh, Blumenbach will publish the very relevant book on the natural variety of humankind he will rely on the classifications uh, from Carlinet, these four ones. And, and then he reworked his classification based on uh, looking at human skulls. So um, for, for Blumenbach, skulls were important to analyze the differences between human races. The criteria of this analysis was not necessarily metrical. It was more about looking at the different shapes and to certain criteria of aesthetic criteria that Blumen had had. So which one was more beautiful than other? And relying on skulls in a way was also very symbolic because it kind of represented the, the brain, the capacity of the mind, the human. So it was not just like analyzing a hand or something like this. It was really kind of the essence of man. Here we can see, and man, yeah, I know, but they refer also a lot to man only. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so here we see um, the, the five different varieties that um, he developed, the five different races, which are Caucasian, Mongolian, Malayan, Ethiopian, and American. And each of those is represented with one skull of the kind. 
what is interesting is that this category will really become a standard in the time, and some of these words were uh, central to the development of current disciplines like physical anthropology and forensics. One of these very relevant um, words is the word Caucasian, is a race associated to the European or the white. And this was introduced by uh, Blumenbach, um, described from the most beautiful and the best form of man, and also the most beautiful skull. Um, this skull has a um, quite sad story. It belonged to a um, young, well, a, a female, a, a woman, who was captured uh, from her land between Georgia and, Ro and Russia, so in the Cauca Caucasus, and um, well, was kind of uh, captured and then lived a very bad life in Europe as a prostitute and eventually died. Later, they collected her, the head, and now is still in a, in a place in Jena, in a box, as a reference of the Caucasian race. What is interesting, I think, uh, despite the horrible story behind this, is that this word of Caucasian remains in, liter in scientific literature, in different studies. And this is some, the kind of things that kind of produce some worry on me, because I don't necessarily know what this word means or if the, per the people who's using this category know exactly how this label was shaped in time. Um, anyways, going back to Blumenbach, um, he also thought that humans were the descendant of um, Adam and Eve, and that uh, the, the ones who were like the Caucasians, who were the most well-formed, were the closest progeny to, to Adam and Eve. And then the white color was the original color, and then all the other different races were some sort of changes due to environment and, in a way, less perfect than the Caucasian. Um, yeah, so this was a very uh, important idea at the time. It traveled to different disciplines and also to different times. Here I just have two examples from uh, two different authors. One comes from uh, Petrus Kamper from the Netherlands. Uh, and the dissert dissertation on the natural varieties which characterize the human physiognomy, what he developed was um, something he called the facial angle, which is uh, some sort of line that people draw, like here in the middle, and that kind of uh, made easier also for artists to represent different physiognomies, different faces, different uh, yeah, types of uh, faces. Um, in this, in this um, drawing, I think it's very interesting to see how this progression of the facial angle is going from humans to uh, primates, including orangutan, and which already tells us a, a kind of a different story that trans goes beyond the human and puts the human in a kind of um, hierarchy with, the, uh, with other animals. Um, interestingly as well, the perfect facial angle was assigned to the Greek sculpture of Apollo, which is a, not a real face, but a sculpture of a Greek. And this became the kind of the let's say, the, yeah, the, the exemplar of beauty and the reference point to organize all the different faces. So in the second image on the side, we have um, an illustration from the book of Types of Mankind, already from 1854, from Norton Gliddon, which is a very famous book in anthropology. And in this, you can see how they're comparing um, the Apollo face with um, the African or race, their Negro, and then um, the orangutan or chimpanzee, I cannot see, but then a non-human. Then 
locating non-white races in this kind of a gradual change towards perfection. Um, then we are moving very fast to the 20th century when physical anthropology developed a lot. Uh, at this time, um, it was like the main interest of people was to develop tools that could really tell you what is different about people. We want standardized and objective measurements. You have to imagine that um, people is traveling, you know, in colonial adventures, people from Europe, but also the US, are traveling to different places in the world. They're facing a lot of people that look really different, that have different cultures. And you want to bring back this knowledge, and you want this knowledge to be objective and standardized, and then you need tools. So they develop a lot of tools, a lot of measurements, a lot of indexes to bring back these reports to um, Europe. And here we have just three examples. Uh, in the first picture, there's a man who's been measured in the nose. It's just an example of the extensive set of measurements that were taken in the face, in the head, and in the body to define race, to determine race. And then we have two examples of other objects that were used to also determine the exact color of eyes, as in the table in above, and the exact color of hair. The advantage is that you, you didn't have to say something like, oh, blonde, or something like that. You could actually say the number that it's written on that table, making it a bit more uh, reliable for other people. So these instruments were part of these colonial adventures on, of the need of registering these differences in a scientific way. Um, so I'm moving very fast to the 1950s and to different ways in which these ideas of race be, get popularized in different um, fields. Here, this is an example of a textbook of geography from the 50s, where we see um, how then a particular kind of human, like for example, that first guy with a suit, uh, who is a representative of the white race, is also put in the context of, of a city which looks quite European, organized and kind of civilized. So there's a connection between these uh, biological or like body traits that we have been discussed before to cultural and lifestyles, cultural differences and lifestyles. Uh, in this uh, image, we also have examples of the yellow race and of the um, black race. And each of them is, again, linked to specific lifestyles and ways of uh, dressing, but also ways of living, as in the um, black race being um, put together with a setting that looks with some huts and naked, almost naked people. So this to say that um, it was, it became common to think that this was something that existed and that a specific kinds of people were associated with a specific ways of living. So phrases like, of all human races, the white race is the most civilized, brings this idea of progress of certain cultures not being as developed as others. Or nowhere on earth lives a race which equals the intelligence and ingenuity of the white race, kind of give us the same idea. Um, so we are in the moment where um, a lot of horrible stories happen because of racial science. Um, the World War ended in 1945. Um, horrible genocides happen in the name of racial difference. And scientists wonder, what should we do? We need to do something. 
So the UNESCO uh, reunite a committee to talk about race. They wrote four declarations on race. The years are written there. And the idea is, was to have like an interdisciplinary group of scientists. So there were evolutionary uh, biologists, there were anthropologists, and they were come together to discuss about that. Interestingly, at the moment they agree in uh, the need to develop a valid notion of race, biologically valid notion of race, but avoid hierarchical um, readings or interpretations of these differences. To me, that's very interesting because they didn't decide that race didn't exist. They just decided that race was not a reason why to, to treat people in different ways. So a it was more like an ethical commitment. Um, still, that had an uh, impact in how we did science, and um, in the late part of the 20th century, we see less, but still some parts we see it uh, still there. As, as we see less the use of race, more the use of words like ethnicity and population, especially in genetics and evolutionary um, works. And finally, around the 2000s, when we had some of the first sequences of the Human Genome Project, people claim that now biological race is over. We have just seen how much similarities we have. There are so many. We have pretty much the same genes. Um, so we can stop thinking about races. Um, however, what happened was very interesting because instead of moving away from looking at differences and focus on what makes us uh, similar, we just look for more differences. We wanted to know from that minimal part that uh, makes us different what really it is. And then kind of Yet again comes a discussion on human difference that then brings with it um, all ideas of racial difference, continental difference, isolation, a lot of concepts that are recovered by genetics. Um, in the cover of the science magazine, uh, for example, we see kind of a double helix metaphor made of different faces that come, well, in a way, represent kind of different types of human, different populations. And this gives us a hint of the search for difference that came at the time. Um, uh, this is uh, just another example. It's from my own genetic test a lot of time ago, like, I don't know, 15 years ago. Where, um, where they determined that half of my genes belong to the American continent, so they are indigenous, and half of my genes are European, and I have very, very little African there. Despite that, and despite me being the perfect admixed person from Mexico, as what is expected from my, uh, the myth of race in my nation, but I think it's really interesting is how in genetics, again come back these same points of difference, the Caucasian, the African, the, and the European, in my case. Now, studies of ancestry are much more sophisticated, and they have a lot of different populations going on, and also they mix ethnicities mostly to determine the ancestry of people. But this is, I thought it was a good example of, to show how uh, continental imaginaries of populations or races continue to kind of creep into some of the studies uh, that were done in, the, in the, the beginning of the 21st century. Um, I don't want to say it, uh, that scientists don't know anything about this. They do, and they are also reflecting a lot about that. There's uh, continually more papers and more reflection from different fields, from medicine, from genetics. A lot of this literature as well comes mainly from uh, the U.S. Uh, scientific community, who are also, as we know, 
who have also a very different way of understanding race. So they're reflecting on that, and um, I think it's very hopeful that they're searching for a way to get rid or curve the use of the term race, searching for alternatives. But we also need to acknowledge the challenges because what happens in science is that many times data that was collected in the past is then labeled according to specific categories that were okay to use in the past and that if you want to use them later, then you need to kind of find a different way to relabel this, this data and sometimes information might not be there. So it's challenging to try to really kind of move away completely from these old ways of using uh, racial uh, ca categories in science. Um, now I just want to give you another example, two examples more. One comes from um, the field I'm studying more closely, which is microbiome research. And with this, this example, I want to talk about how these ideas of progress, of race, of civilization, of culture, come again into how we interpret different lifestyles and different, um, different populations. So uh, before that, um, maybe I should explain what the microbiome is. So the microbiome is uh, this collection of bacteria, viruses, and all sorts of organisms that we have in our bodies. So they're in the gut, they're in our mouth, vagina, and on our skin, they're everywhere. And it was so shocking to realize that a lot of our cells are actually not human, and that a lot of our genes are also not human. So people were like going crazy when they discovered that the proportion, I think you cannot see the numbers, but they're really, like, really crazy. But the proportion of 150 non-human genes to one makes you wonder, huh? Okay. So kind of the idea is that this revelation also changed a lot how we understand our health and how um, the environment and our diets and our lifestyle is actually influencing our health because these microbes change with the things we do. So if we start eating more vegetables, then we will have a different collection of microbes than if we start eating, I don't know, a lot of ice cream. Um, so scientists, what they want to do is to figure out how these microbes are influencing our health. For example, things like, oh, this is very small, diabetes, um, cancer, but also um, psychological diseases or many other things, asthma, for example. So the idea is to fi figure out how the combination of specific uh, lifestyle, um, going on the bike, for example, if you live in Utrecht, um, and the combination with genetic ancestry together somehow create this special microbiome ecosystem and changes your uh, health. That's what they want to do. My problem with uh, some things that are coming with the field and things that I think need to be discussed and revised is some of the representations that these focus on lifestyle, diet, and difference bring within this, in this discipline. This image is from a paper from 2017 and it depicts three different ways of living, so to say. On the corner, we see the hunter-gatherers who are depicted in, with the huts and the arrows and forest and who mainly eat game when they go hunting. Um, in the second intermediate stage, we have what is called as the agriculturalist, lifestyle, so agriculture started, there's farms and people cultivate stuff and they look like farmers as well. And then the third stage is a urban um, lifestyle. 
we see people that is somehow dressed up, um, lives in cities, and has a lot of medicines, and it's like sandwiches or something in the corner. But what I like about this, well, I like and don't like, I actually don't like, but what I think it's interesting to look at this story, in this image, sorry, is that there are two arrows here. And one of those, the fat one below, is depicting uh, the increasing microbial diversity. And this is because, um, as I was saying, lifestyle and what you eat influence your microbiome. So it is believed that, or is seen, that micro, um, hunter-gatherer populations or people who live in this kind of lifestyle have a, a higher diversity of microbes than people who live in the city. So that means that also their health is better than people who live in the city. So scientists want to know what's the secret about these people, right? So they go and study hunter-gatherers or people who live outside the city. Um, in that process, an additional story that this image tells is a story on um, that crosses time. If you see the other arrow, the more straighter arrow, below it says Neolithic Revolution, and the other arrow says Urbanization and Industrialization. So to me, this arrow is indicating that the first stage is actually previous in time than the later stage. And this mixture of hunter-gatherers, um, lifestyle outside the cities, but also something like back in time, again brings back this idea of a sequential step or sequential um, kind of development until we all live in cities, as in urbanization was kind of where we all, or we all should move towards. Um, and I think this is problematic, also because of the way the different populations are depicted, by the way. Um, and then um, I get more worried when I see pub uh, publications like this one, in which, well, the title is The Microbiome of Uncontacted Amerindians, to refer to studies done in Yanomami, the populations who live between Venezuela and Brazil, who are taken as to be this exemplary population who has lived outside urbanization always, so uncontacted, and uh, who are representative of this other lifestyle. What is interesting, and is as shown in these pictures, they have been the object of study of, of medi, um, uh, anthropologists, but also biomedical people since at least 80 years. So they have been under contact of scientists since at least the uh, 1950s. But they still con continue to be the uncontacted people. And what I think here is happening is some sort of um, reification or use of stereo stereotypes to understand these others' ways of living that are not useful at all. I think more useful would be to look at current Yanomamis as people with problems that need things uh, from, that ask for help, not for money, ask for help, and that are suffering real challenges to their lifestyle, as for example by illegal gold mines in their land, which are responsible for the transmission of diseases, pollution, mercury, etc. So, I am, my fear is that if we continue, or if we are not aware of how these stereotypes can get into the way of how we understand other lifestyles and other populations, and if we continue somehow uh, not questioning this racial uh, framework, we can not really see where uh, the help of science is needed. Um, 
The second example I have is more about medical practice and it's about the U.S. So it's probably different from what we're living here. Very probably, yeah. Um, but this talks about something that is really hard to believe for me. Because despite that everything has happened, the story that I gave you in these last 40 minutes, and the um, evident danger that uh, racial differences and racial categorizations had brought, there are still racial biases in medical practice, for example, in which some uh, physicians can believe that black people's skin is thicker than white people, and that because of that, they don't feel uh, pain or as much pain as white people. Um, this, is, uh, this has enormous consequences, as these physicians then will medicate or do recommendations differently because, well, they don't have to make that much pain, which is outrageous but still relevant. This paper was from 2016. So I'm going to stop now. Just want to leave you with uh, three thoughts that maybe we can discuss as well. Uh, the first one is about the need to, for awareness of the pervasive racialization in society and science. So. It is just um, the story that I have told you has many, many years in place. And sadly, we have learned to see difference in that way. This changes from context to context, of course. Uh, I'm not saying that we all see race in the same way, but we do see this. And this leads to racism. So we need to be aware of that. We are part of that cultural system. And... I think one step out of racism would be to be aware of that. The second is to revise our beliefs and kind of also scientifically our assumptions and to see, kind of evaluate, am I actually assuming some sort of uh, progress idea in biology or in how I'm looking at different cultures, kind of be a bit more reflective on that personally and also in our disciplines. And the third one is kind of an acknowledgement of the West not always being the best in the sense that we should be able to acknowledge diversity in lifestyles, cultures, and bodies without setting a kind of ideal of perfection in what is not. Thank you. Abigail, thank you so much for this uh, lecture. Um, I have a question for you. I read on the, your uh, profile page at Utrecht University that your main aim is to stop racism in both science and society. Yeah. And I was wondering, how are you trying to do that? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> it's just that it's also a very big aim. But I think um, um, part of how I'm trying to do that is speaking about this topic and to show how um, it is not the other who has maybe racial ideas or racialized uh, kind of uh, ways of seeing to other people, but that's something that is happening all the time and that we should be aware of that. And I'm particularly interested in looking at how science, which is a, such a powerful truth maker in our times is kind of shaping us in these ways. Mm. So, yeah. And do you also sometimes put it into concrete action, such as if you see an image like that, do you like write an email to the, to the authors or something like that? Or <laughs> yeah, that would be a good idea, actually. Yeah, I will do that. No, no. <laughs> More ideas, welcome. I do try to kind of put the message across more from teaching and research, mm -hmm. but uh, more concrete actions, I still need to get into that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Uh, I'll get the microphone so I can... Yeah. Ask if you have audience. more ideas. I already see some raised hands. 
Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. It was really fascinating, I think, as well. Um, and your aim is quite ambitious, but I, uh, I hope I can support you in that. I was wondering, you mentioned I don't believe in race, and, well, as you explained, it's, it, it is a matter of fact of believing in classifications, but I was wondering how would you, especially since we're talking about modern biology, how would you treat the differences that, that are there in, in between people? Uh, because obviously you can imagine the genetic differences cause cancer in some people and not in other people. Yeah. But how would you approach that different if you if if we're used to classifying them in races, how would you approach them differently? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And it's the question I wanna answer in my project. But one of the ideas that I think we could do or that we can kind of change this is to look at um, the relevant differences between people. Because what I show today is that race was shaped in a very specific framework and based on a lot of evidence and thoughts that maybe were relevant then, but it doesn't mean that these categories are actually relevant or are helping us to understand the differences that maybe genetically or in other health issues can help us to better approach a um, health problem. So it could be the case that, and it is actually the case, that perhaps people living in a contaminated environment will have more in common because they live there than because of them being of the same race. So I think um, one way to do that is to get the time and funding to discover which populations with distinctions are actually making the world the work we want to do. And that would be a way I would think this could be done. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. So I'm wondering about the social identification people do have with race and how do you see the link between, so genetically there's no no scientific base for race, but I know in, in many countries there's still strong social identification and people also sometimes like that and find it hard to let go of that. So how do you see the link between the social part and the scientific scientific way of looking at it? Yeah, that's an excellent question as well. Um, yeah, I acknowledge that there's a, a lot of people or like some groups that find it part of their identity. So racial identities are also very important to have. And then I think then probably we can take this as a relevant category in that case. Because if, if, if this is part of your identity, because all the, tra the historical traction that it has, I'm not going to tell you to stop calling yourself like that, right? But what I can actually question is to actually move that category of people who is acknowledging themselves as such to another group who actually don't have that um, need to refer themselves with such a category, which is, I think, what is happening sometimes in science. We have a lot of uh, studies that come from the U.S., and the, in the U.S., races and have a very important uh, cultural relevance and also administrative, you know, everyone has to cross which race are you when you go there. And, um, and certainly their way to understanding their identity will be influenced by this process because it's a social cultural process. But it doesn't mean then that we have to kind of bring those categories to a context where that actually doesn't make sense. For example, in Mexico, it will not make sense to talk in those terms. I, I'm, my hunch is that also here, probably not, but I don't know exactly. So the point is, uh, even if in this effort of science to be general, kind of these categories have been imposed on other cat populations that don't necessarily have this link. So I would say, if you feel identify with, this ra with a racial category, that's excellent but then don't use it to categorize other people who don't have this feeling of identification. Yeah, clear. Clear. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes. Uh, let's see how I get there. Oh, thanks. We're coming to me. Yeah. Yes. Here's the microphone. Oh, hi. Um, I I'm can hold it. It's, it's, I trust you. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. Uh, you mostly talk about Homo sapiens, of course, in this context. What, uh, what do you think of uh, thinking about race in other animals, like dogs, for example? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, um, in Spanish it's also called raza, raza de perros. Yeah. So this comes from um, breeding processes, right? So artificially selecting for specific traits in dogs or doves or sheep. And this has been a very important process in also very inspiring for evolutionary theory. Darwin was kind of obsessed with this process of artificial selection. And I think in that case, the word race has a very different meaning because it's talking about um, selected properties in a line of animals that um, humans have created with a purpose. And in that way, perhaps also there's a purpose. You see, there's like an ideal of, oh, I want to select for more milk in cows or more uh, wool, which is exactly what I was trying to say with saying there's no directionality in the other process because there's no goal. So I, I would be, I guess, okay with the use of race in other organisms uh, given that these are kind of artificially selected for. The same happens with um, uh, vegetables and stuff. So, yeah. But good point. Thank you. I, I might have a follow-up question on this. Yes. Um, because uh, in terms of evolution, uh, your point is very clear that now there is no direction and it's evolution just works to make species fit for their environment. But if you look back to like the origins of evolution, like when it started, when life was just consisting of single cell organisms uh, that developed into multi-cell organisms and then uh, managed to survive on land instead of only in the sea, for example, is that also a, a non-directional? Or did evolution at a certain point stop, stop being directional? Um. So, I, I th well, I have to say that it was a very simplified way of understanding evolution, and there are also different theories of how complexity emerged and things like that. Um, but from here, uh, I would say that it is also non-directional in the sense that you have to imagine that evolution has taken like many, 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 many years, mm -hmm. and that this process of interaction between the environment and organisms ha happens all the time, and that we can expect that variation is constantly emerging from these different organisms, either by sexual reproduction or other ways of multiplication. So it's kind of uh, something, I would say, that is non-directional and it has just occupied space in, and eventually populated different, different landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many different processes involved in this evolutionary story. So probably it's not only our, our framework on natural selection might not explain everything, but it's, a, I think, a robust framework to, to understand also those stages. Oh, yeah. So just going from an uninhabited Earth to an inhabited Earth. With, uh, yeah, direction. some processes yeah. of the symbiosis and very, yeah, and, uh, yes, I think so. <laughs> it's getting quite complicated, yeah, but thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, by reducing the use of race as a construct, how will we avoid the colorblind approach? Some people tend to use, because I think that can be damaging as well, because um, some people tend to say, oh, um, I don't see color, and I think that can be very damaging as well, uh, taking whiteness as neutral and comparing that to other races. Yes, you're totally right, and I, I, I really thank you for your question. So um, when I say I don't believe in biological races, I'm not supporting a colorblind uh, society. Um, as I said, like I think racism is one of the main problems. And then the idea would be to identify 
what, which practices in science and society are racializing groups and producing this discrimination and inequalities to specific groups, which doesn't necessarily imply that we have to believe that there's some sort of intrinsic biological difference in these groups, given that the origin of these racial classifications is a colonial enterprise. So it was kind of creation put on people. But we can combine your worry with the other question on what happened when you want to self-identify with a particular race. Because kind of the answers that I'm giving here are quite general. And you have to look, my point is that you really have to look to the specific context. And I think um, we are already moving away from, or we're trying, and it would be ideal to move away from a colorblind uh, situation that doesn't help at all. But we still should not then fall back into believing that this is a biological difference because I think it's more a historical colonial legacy that can, that can bring real inequalities and real differences in health and in, I don't know, opportunities in life, but that is not necessarily coming from evolution or from biology. So for me, that will be important. But I hope that's... Thank you. Yes? Thank you. Uh, I have a question about, um, you went into uh, the face shapes and how that was a part of science and the development of uh, race. And um, I have seen on social media um, it coming forward that people are starting to use it again to see the beauty of faces <laughs> and everything like that. How do you think this affects the progress of science at this moment if that gains popularity again? Um, you mean that you have seen how people use, for example, the angle thing? Oh, really? I haven't yeah. seen that, but that's... Okay, interesting. Um, well, I think this facial angle measurement fits within the history of science in, that, in its context. But we now can take a look at that and wonder whether a 90 degree angle is actually telling you something scientific. So I think uh, if we are facing or if people is re retaking these tools to make scientific claims, we can say from now like, wait, this is not really a scientific measurement on the body. This is something that was devised as part of a long history of race aiming to be scientific, but we can kind of separate that from our current state of science, so to say. So I wouldn't take this, uh, I wouldn't take scientific claims from that, but you're right in saying that a lot of these uh, measurements and ideas, for example, of um, how, how there was this study about how wide the face is correlated to criminality that was then fed onto algorithms, totally crazy. And then we have to be really careful because we really have to separate kind of these kind of implicit ideas of what evolution and progress and beauty that are fed then in new technologies. So that would be, I don't know if that was an answer. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, here was another question. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk, that was great. Um, you gave an example of uh, a silly difference between uh, black and white people, black people having a higher uh, pain threshold. Um, mm. uh, is there also a reason to, because many of clinical studies are done on young, white, mm. highly educated men, yes. and there are some... For example, maybe start with doing some tests on women, uh, but also um, there, there are some thoughts about maybe we should do more tests on people with different ethnic backgrounds. Is there still reason for that in your <laughs> in this framework? Or 
or not? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think that connects with other questions before about um, what, is, what if there are really real differences, right? How to account for this? And um, especially when I was talking about the Human Genome Project and, and the focus on difference, all this idea of inclusivity, of including other groups because everything was done on the mail, or you know, like, as you described that. And these results don't fit other groups. That's a fact. But then the question, I think, that has been done in some of these studies is specific to something you want to find, not necessarily what is the, dif the racial differences be between these in this particular trait. So kind of the, the pain example is very blunt and like, it's horrible and unbelievable. But I think it, it is very different from other studies that have made an effort into really understanding how different kinds of populations react to, for example, um, I don't know, medicines or things like that. Um, and these studies are very, very important given that many of these conditions work differently in different kinds of body, not only in terms of race but all, or ethnicity, but also like uh, age, um, as social, economical background, and many other factors. Kind of short question, we should do them, but maybe not on the, the lines of racial differences, but others. Thank you. Thank, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. I really found it really interesting. I wanted to ask whether you think um, uh, species has any biological reality? Ah. Because since it's, of course, grounded in the same yeah. problematic authors. And um, you're, you must be aware of this philosopher, Peter Singer, who coined the term speciesism as, as the belief that, that some species are inherently better than others. And I wonder whether you think he has a point or whether he's missing something. Uh -huh. Damn. <laughs> so you're also referring to animals now, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. So the notion of species, mm, well, no, I don't think. I think it's more like, an, like a tool that we have dev devised to refer to different organisms. And it's quite biased because many of these concepts of species that we have are based on vertebrates and plants sometimes. But already when you go to the bacteria, uh, environment, they don't hold at all. So it's not the case that genetically or any other way that we have devised to differentiate species works for all the different organisms. And I would say it's really rela uh, related to what we have studied more, which is uh, mammals and maybe humans. So I would, I would stand in the side of the debate where we are a bit constructivist about the notion of species. However, it is quite central in biology, and I think, well, I think we use it all the time. Um, about this- you it by saying you're in the constructivist? Yeah, like uh, we use, I use it like we have it as a tool, but I, I don't necessarily commit to their reality, like their ontological existence as itself. So I don't think that, um, okay, this is getting complicated. <laughs> so um, I think we as scientists develop different ways of naming things and develop systems to organize things in nature. And the, the species concept is problematic because um, well, it's supposed to be biological, but sometimes, and many other organisms don't, don't fit this, this definition. So there have been different efforts to also kind of have different concepts of species in biology, and then it, when you get into philosophy, it gets more complicated. But when I say constructivist, it's more like, okay, we use it, it works sometimes, but doesn't necessarily mean that organisms are divided as such. Um, if, if scientists were not on the earth, mm. maybe you wouldn't have to divide them as species. It's something that we develop to make sense oh, of yeah. it. And it sometimes so, works, but it doesn't always apply to reality. reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then uh, really like the, the bacterias are so amazing 
<laughs> because and they really challenge many of our understanding of the biological world because we haven't we don't know anything about that or we know very little in contrast to many other things we know from yeah like vertebrates or mammals or mm. other organisms which might fit better to the species concept and then um, about this um, other um, concept well I, I don't necessarily agree with that as well um, and um, yeah I will, I, I will say that um, from my biological point of view and what I have been trying to explain we do have a mechanism to explain change without the need of these other metaphysical ideas or these philosophical ideas to support ideas of progress. So I would disagree with, but we can have a conversation about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a bit in the dark. Like, what, what is, is it what you disagree with? Uh, with uh, the idea of species. Uh, can you repeat the... Speciesism. Speciesism. Yeah, I always say speciesism. Speciesism. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the idea of progress. So, yeah, I don't think we need these kind of concepts if we understand evolution as it that is supposed to happen and all the different mm -hmm. processes that are involved. Yeah. Thanks. Do you want to say something back or? <laughs> um, well, of course, you know, whatever you might then say of uh, the, the, the use of species as a tool, you might then also say of race, once again, that, you know, perhaps it helps explain some differences. And then, of course, it's a useful fiction, right? So that... that that's, I don't know if you're aware of this paper that was published on, uh, uh, that was I think a year ago in in, in, in a philosophy journal on, quote unquote Jewish intelligence. It's an anti-Semitic paper, and then that, that author would be the first to claim that you know I'm not talking about any biological reality. It's a it's a construct that I use to talk to explain why J Jewish people seem to me so so much smarter, and 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 and, uh, and then silently in the background he was saying that. Jewish people are sneakier or something like this. So, the, so um, that's the point, right? That, 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 that if we're talking useful construct, then why not say the same thing about race? Well, because I don't think race is useful to say anything that is worth saying about human differences. And I think here comes what we do in the HPS program, which is also to connect um, science as a cultural practice that it's within a context, but also that is regulated by some sort of, um, I guess, normative standards. And I, I think that uh, if we continue to use these categories or to claim that race, given what has happened in the past, is a useful concept, uh, we are not kind of learning anything of what happened in the past. So I will disagree with um, saying that this can be called useful. I think it's uh, not useful, it's detrimental. And also the research this person is doing, even if it's statistically sound. I mean, we can also create other kind of categories and prove that we found something, but is this useful to really tell us something about people? I'm not sure. Yeah. I hear this theme coming back like often in the questions and what you're uh, replying. So every time we come back to this theme, like, but is there no use in using this classification? And then you often answer, if I may summarize you, um, that often environmental or cultural factors are actually more useful to tools to classify between people than race. Hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think race is useful because I don't, I don't think it says much. But I rather think that there should be a connection between our research question and the way we label objects that we study. So I guess for this guy, race was useful because he wanted to make this claim. But if we want to learn more about, I don't know, health inequalities between different people, uh, we probably need to pay attention to other factors like, I don't know, like where people live or what they eat, where are they suffering as part of also racism. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 
all the way back again. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I was just curious because uh, throughout this evening, a few times uh, the term evolutionary fitness was mentioned. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain this a bit more. Evolutionary what? Sorry. Uh, evolutionary fitness. Ah, fitness. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, well, I guess it's more about adaptation. I, I don't know if I said fitness. I probably did. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, what I tried to say, for example, with the, exa the example of the different moth, the white and the dark, is that as we understand the theory of evolution now with the mechanism of natural selection, we will have a combination of the environment and environmental change, and then certain organisms be surviving better, so to say, and then be more fit, if you want to put it in those terms, than others in that context. So in, in the example of the moths, you will have that the, the situation where uh, this smoke coming from the fabrics and stuff will make this uh, darker smoke fitter in that particular um, uh, yeah, context. Um, but then this will probably change again if things change as well. So, um, yeah, I guess that's what I meant with, with the concept. Is that...? Uh, yeah, just to clarify, it just survives better. So, it, yes, survives. More of them survive. Okay, yeah, got it. Not Thanks. better. More of them. <laughs> okay, okay. Beware of those words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe a little, f a little bit of a follow-up on the discussion in front. Um, I was still left a bit curious because um, I do think actually acknowledging speciesism can be very useful in explaining uh, how we treat other animals. And I do actually think there is some colonial thinking in that as well, in how we approach uh, ecological habitats, for, ex uh, for example. Um, how do you look at that in like 30 years? Will, will we look back at uh, how we treat other intelligent life like we look back at these scientists of the uh, former centuries uh, like we do now? Or how do you look at that? Yeah, thank you. I think we are already looking a, a little bit like that in relation to other organisms, right? Like we're a bit more aware of. Um, other organisms uh, being also alive and having rights to exist. And your question of how we're going to look back to ourselves is something that really puzzles me because, I don't know, I hope, uh, I mean, I hope that we are doing the right thing with what we're doing. And, um, but then again, um, probably we, are, we have a lot of blind spots still, and this will come with, uh, in the future. So I, I'm always suspicious about um, how we try to do good sometimes, because this sometimes implies a lot of like, ideas and assumptions we have about what, where we want to help and stuff like this. And this is something that I feel that can then bring us certain challenges in the future. So, yeah, I will, I will have to take a, take a view of this concept as in that context. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's always a possi possible that we look back and, and, yeah, regret some of the things we did, even if we did it the best we could now. Sufficient answer? Or you have a follow-up? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I also uh, received a question from the online online audience, uh, someone asks, um, do you know the work of Catherine Harden from the University of Texas? She researches the impact of genetics on life outcomes. Do you think this is a dangerous field of research? I don't think I'm very familiar with this work. I would need a little bit more of uh, references mm -hmm. to answer that. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, so I think the... the, the uh, yeah, I think it's also a bit of a like a 
how maybe the bigger question behind this would be something like um, is it a dangerous is, is um, research on genetics and how it influences our behavior is that also uh, a field of research where we should be very careful with how we classify uh, what questions we ask hmm. so but uh, is it about like how we want to direct or like select a specific traits in humans or something like this, like some sort of eugenics, or I think I'm not understanding really well <laughs> the, <laughs> where the question I is I also going. don't have more context. Sorry for the online viewer that is asking this question. Um, so maybe you can clarify. <laughs> and then in the meantime, we will continue with uh, the live audience here. Yes. Um, I kind of wanted to maybe bring us a bit uh, back to basics because we're talking about how this kind of frame of thinking affects um, science, which I think it's a very important discussion. But I recently came across a lot of uh, instances where I think um, the general uh, kind of public's understanding of evolution was related uh, to issues like right, racism or this idea of directionality, the, the walk of progress, etc., um, and I think the, it is probably tied to the way um, evolution is, is, is taught um, very like on, like very early on. And I was wondering if you had any ideas of how um, with our current understanding we could also apply, uh, yeah, like change the way it is, is taught like from like the beginning. Because I think, you know, it's nice to talk about this to people who are already quite educated and can contribute like to new research. But then um, I think it's very important to have just the average person know about the, uh, you know, race, species, those are just constructs. And I feel like those, th this idea is not really well communicated. Um, yeah, sorry, this is a very loaded question. No, All thanks. Right. That's, um, um, yeah, I agree with you. This, I mean, we should be able to um, teach a more complex uh, way of understanding evolution as in non-directed and um, and I think this is possible like for example in the institute I work there's also people who are doing science education and science communication and uh, our three groups together are kind of trying to aim to give a more co complex idea of what science does and to also bring this to not only academic spheres or people who already know a lot about it, but also to perhaps um, people in school or in uh, like uh, just recently learning about biology. Um, what is interesting as well is to see like representations like this one, which are quite funny and are very popular. And then I guess an idea would be also to use these like very common representations, you know, like how we became this homo sapiens with a cell phone, um, to kind of also bring these ideas that are more complex about evolution and yeah, races. But I think it's possible. It just needs a lot of work, I guess. <laughs> if you have any ideas of how to do that, then uh, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> I would think it's a start to right, remove those kind of, because like, I think it's, uh, this, this representation has been used in most textbooks and mm -hmm. the kind of like Lamarckian uh, example with the giraffe, I feel like oh, yeah. that still kind of lingers, even though it's a, such a uh, old idea, I think. Th there are a lot of like representations that maybe some teachers were taught with like they, when they were students, and I think it kind of can stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe to revise some of the textbooks or things that are used to teach biology. Yeah, thanks. We have time for one final question or remark. If you just want to say something without uh, putting a question mark at the end of it, that's also fine. No? Well, you're a perfectly timed audience then. <laughs> well, thank you, Abigail, very much for your lecture. I found it super interesting and also, even, even though I know that this research exists, still I find it quite shocking to see all those images with these different categorizations of hair or the angles and stuff. So yeah, I think I will remember it for quite some time again.
So thank you. Uh, before we go to the applause, um, we would like to ask you something. Uh, we really are really curious to know what you think uh, of the lectures we organize here. So if you have time, please scan this QR code and fill in a short questionnaire uh, and let us know what you think. And that was it for this evening. So a warm applause for Dr. Abigail. Thank you.